All right, we're good to go. All right. Well, let's let's give it. Oh, I guess my clock did just change to eight thirty, so we are good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Welcome. This is the March fourth meeting for the Thurston Regional Planning Council. I'm calling this meeting to order, and we're going to start with introductions. And how we're going to do this is I'm going to go through our roster. We have lots of new faces, relatively new faces. So we'll go through the roster. And if you are representing um, as a member from that organization, please introduce yourself. And then I'm going to hand it off to Executive Director Mark Daly to introduce TRPC and other staff attending the meeting. So let's go ahead and start with City of Olympia. Good morning, Clark Gilman. Glad to be here. Hi, Clark. How about City of Lacey? Good morning, Robin Vasquez, representing the city of Lacey. Hey, Robin, nice to have you. And Thanks. what about city of Tumwater? I thought I saw somebody. Oh, yeah. Eileen, we just called city of Tumwater. You want to introduce yourself? All right, good morning. I'm trying to figure out my technology. This is Eileen Swartha, and I'm a council member with the city of Tumwater. Good morning. Hi, Eileen. And what about Thurston County? Good morning. My name is Matt Osman, Thurston County Traffic Engineer. I am pinch hitting for Commissioner Edwards today. Hi, welcome, Matt. Nice to have you. And city of Rainier. Dennis McVeigh. Good morning. Hi, Dennis. Hello. How about, how about city of Tenino? The great city of Tenino, John O'Callaghan, representing the great yes. city of Tenino. Sorry, John, I'll make a note. <laughs> Thank you. Good, and you? And how about Bucota? Anyone from Bucota today? Okay, well, we'll come back and check at the end. And um, Confederated Tribes of the Chehalis Reservation. Okay. How about 10? All right. How about the Nisqually Indian Tribe? Hello, David Al from the Squally Tribe. Hey, David. And North Thurston Public Schools. Good morning, yeah. Melissa. Oh, is Gretchen, Gretchen there? Yes, I am. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> Sorry. You got double representation. Awesome. How about Tumwater School District? We'll check in again. Maybe Mel will join us a little bit later. And Intercity Transit. Oh, I'm Olympia School District, Hillary Seidel. Uh, Intercity Transit. Uh, this is Debbie Sullivan. I'm representing Inner City Transit. Hi, Debbie. Um, how about Lot Clean Water Alliance? <laughs> Carolyn Cox, the new lot representative. Hi, Carolyn. Nice to have hey. you. Thank you. And Port of Olympia. <clears throat> Bob Ayel here for the Port of Olympia. Hi, Bob. Nice to have you. Thank you. And then we've got PUD of Thurston County. I guess I'll Chris. Chris Stearns, how are you doing today? Hi, Chris. Nice to see you. Um, how about Thurston Co Conservation District? Good morning. It's Helen Wheatley from the Conservation District. Hi, Helen. Um, Lacey Fire District 3. Rick Hello, Rick Kelling. Hi, Rick. And uh, Puget Sound Regional Council? No? OK. How about the Evergreen State College? Scott Morgan, the Evergreen State College. Hey, Scott. And Thurston, e Thurston EDC, sorry. Is Michael here? No, okay. And how about the Timberland Regional Library? Okay. Uh, did anybody notice if we had folks jump in from folks I already asked to introduce themselves? I did not see any chair. I didn't either. Okay, so I'm going to hand it off to Mark now to introduce TRPC staff and other staff attending. So we've got a, a full house today. So forgive me in advance if I if I miss anyone. Um, so from uh, TRPC, we've got myself, Mark Daly, I'm the director, uh, Vina Tabbitt, uh, Amy Hatchwinica, Michael Ambrogi, Paul Brewster, Dorinda Merrill, Aiden Dixon, Dave Reed. Katrina Van Every, and uh, I, I think that's it. 
Um, from Inner City Transit, we've got Ann Freeman Manzanares and Eric Phillips. From Olympia, we have Joyce Phillips and Leonard Bauer. From Lacey, we have Rick Walk and Martin Hoppy. From Tumwater, we have Mike Matlock and Mary Heather Ames. And that's as far as I got before. So did I miss staff? Um, no, but I see that Mayor DePinto joined us, so. And we also have a guest who's gonna be with us on our Smart Card Corridors presentation, Mark Ann from Parametrix. Okay, great, thank you. Mayor DePinto, you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, um, Joe DePinto, Mayor of Yale. Hi, Joe. And did we have any other members that joined us? Okay, great. So now we're gonna move on to the approval of the agenda, which hopefully everybody took a peek at. So Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Okay. Callahan. Thanks, John. Uh, is there a second? Second, McVeigh. Thank you. It's been I moved. We're going second. home. <laughs> Is there? It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All right. All those in favor of approval of the agenda, say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> okay. <laughs> The agenda is approved and that takes us to the consent calendar, which hopefully everybody had a chance to look over. Is there a motion to approve Move the approval of the consent calendar, McVeigh? Second, O'Callaghan. Great, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All right, all those in favor of approval of the consent calendar, please say aye. 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 Or raise hand, yeah, David, I do both. Okay, great, consent calendar is approved. That moves us to other business and I'm gonna, just uh, review the protocols for presentations. We have a lot of, we have lots of fun work today to do. Um, so I wanted to remind folks that uh, council members will have the opportunity at the end of each presentation to ask questions um, unless otherwise noted. So there might be times when staff would have a break and invite you to ask questions at other times. Um, at the end of every presentation, I will look for raised hands from members who want to ask questions. So if you are participating in the meeting on a computer or smartphone, you should see the raise hand button kind of at the bottom of your screen. If you are calling in, I don't know if we have any caller members today, but if you are calling in, you can also raise your hand by pushing star nine on the keypad on your phone and that will activate the raise hand feature and then I'll know that you want to speak. I will try to run an equitable queue for questions, which I hope will ensure full participation of all members in the meeting. And this means that I might move members up the queue for questions if they have not already asked a question in the meeting, even if someone else raised their hand first. But I will try and maintain the queue and keep track of who's who wants to speak or ask questions on each issue. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and um, hand it off to Mark for our first agenda item, which is the National Highway Freight Program. And Mark, we're taking action on this item today. Correct. This is an action item. Yes. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Mark. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen quickly. Okay. So um, what we have today is an opportunity that's a little different than it's been in um, past years. So the Washington State Department of Transportation, they receive funds from the federal government for National Highway Freight Program. Um, and they have right now an opportunity of $50 million for, to be programmed out over federal fiscal years 2022 to 2025. And this time, uh, Washington State Department of Transportation worked with the Metropolitan Planning Organizations and the Regional Transportation Planning Organizations on the application process. And so this time required that um, the applications come through organizations like ours, um, through the MPOs and the RTPOs. And so that's why we're here um, today taking, looking to take this action. Um, so with that requirement of coordination, our staff worked through our technical advisory committee and we also reached out directly to Port of Olympia, um, Confederated Tribes of the Chehalis and Nisqually Indian Tribe, because um, they're not uh, regular participants in the TAC. And so we wanted to make sure and, and, and eligible um, applicants for the, these grant funds. So we wanted to make sure everyone knew of this opportunity. 
but the opportunity is fairly constrained. It's really for construction related projects, projects that are already um, have already been planned and now they're ready to start moving through the design process, preliminary engineering, right of way acquisition and construction. And so it's not unusual that we wouldn't have a great, and they have to be freight related, obviously. They have to have a very direct connection to improving the movement of freight uh, through our, our region. And so it's not uh, terribly surprising that we don't have a great deal of, of applicants. Thurston County is, is the only applicant so, and one project uh, that, in, that intends to um, apply for this opportunity. And that is uh, the Tilly Road bridge replacement. And this is on Tilly Road, obviously. It would replace a 17 year old, a 72 year old uh, timber bridge on uh, Tilly Road, which is a T2, that's the federal designation um, freight route, which means that it, it uh, carries about four to 10 million tons of, of freight annually. Um, this is a really important freight route to our region, especially when we have issues on I-5. Um, it becomes one of our one of our main ways of getting um, trucks to and through. Uh, so Im important to just keeping our goods and services moving. The total project cost is estimated at 2.25 million. This request uh, from the county is is only for the preliminary engineering and right of way phases. And so the federal request is 440 uh, 529 with a about 60,000 in match. Um, we've re reviewed the, the um, proposal and the grant criteria and believe that it meets the, the funding criteria. And so what the required action is, is that, that we as the MPO submit a list to Washington State Department of Transportation um, by March 16th of the projects that are going to apply for this funding. And so the requested action from council today is to, is to approve our list, which is this project. And then we will work with uh, the county to make sure that we get all the materials in by March 16th. And I'll also note that what you see on the screen here, whoops, went too far, sorry. Um, this is from the county's transportation improvement program. So this is something that the county um, has had on the books and this provides an opportunity to help fund it. And we have Matt Unzelman here, if there are any questions specific to the project, but again, we'll be looking for council okay. action to approve the list. You had me at replace the bridge. Approval. Thanks, Mark. Are there any questions from members? Okay. Well, if not, I would entertain an, a motion to approve the recommended project as the region's list of projects. Already did. Sounds like John. I already already moved to approve. Okay. Moves to John moved to approve. Is there a second? Second, McVeigh. Thank you, Dennis. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the recommended project as the region's list. Is there any further discussion? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great, the list is approved. Thank you, Mark. That brings <laughs> us to our next agenda item, which is smart, smart Corridors Update with Vina Tabbitt from TRPC and Eric Phillips from Inner City Transit. We have planned a 20 minute presentation here with five minutes of discussion and I think we'll hold questions till the end. So if you have questions, make sure that you know where your raise hand button is. And with that, I will go ahead and hand it off to Vina and Eric. Hi, so um, I know we've got some new board members, council members. So I'm Vina Tabbitt. I'm the deputy director of TRPC. Um, Eric Phillips will be also doing most of the presentation. He's the development director of Inner City Transit. And Mark Yand, um, who's part of our consulting team with Parametrics, is also here to handle some of the more detailed questions for us. So we're here to give you um, an update today on something called the Smart Corridors Project, as well as Transit Signal Priority, and give you an update on the project. 
I am just going to give you a really brief overview of um, what we've been trying to achieve through what we call the Smart Corridors Project. Um, so we started working on this around 2006, where we received um, notification that we had an issue with our air quality, specifically particulate matter 10. Um, and what that meant was we received some funding called Congestion Mitigation Air Quality um, Funds, CMAC funds. Specifically, it was for the urbanized area of Lacey, Olympia, and Tumwater of Thurston County. And we received a pot of funding, maybe around three to $400,000 a year to program out to look for air, um, to reduce particulate matter. A group got together um, early on in between 2007 and 2013, talked about what sort of projects would be best to achieve that. And they decided that reducing idling would be one of them. And that set off a series of investments in smart um, technology investments. So the goal is really to invest in technology where we have the most traffic in our region and make those corridors, um, our, what we call our urban corridors, smart, um, more responsive to vehicles talking to each other, that sort of thing. Um, and so, as I said, the primary focus is those urban corridors. So Capitol Way, Martin Way, Harrison Avenue, Pacific Avenue to some degree. Um, where we have the most traffic in our region outside of the interstate. Up to this point, we have either um, award, we have awarded over $5.1 million in federal funds and 800,000 in local funds have been matching those to date. Some of the projects haven't um, finished yet. And one of the ones we're talking about today is there. And um, investments have been given to Department of Transportation, um, Olympia, Lacey, Tumwater, and Thurston County, as well as inner city transit, as well as Thurston Regional Planning Council to convene <laughs> in the earlier discussions. Okay, um, in your staff report, you have um, this graphic to the right that tells you the specific awards and offline, I'm happy to talk about some of the past awards and what's being accomplished. But the, uh, technology does cost quite a bit, um, the signals and that sort of thing. So that's why the dollar number is so high. Okay, I'm going to turn this over to Eric to talk about what is going on now. Thanks, Vina. Good morning. Can everybody hear me okay? I just wanted yeah. to um, appreciate the time to uh, share the update this morning. Again, I'm Eric Phillips. I'm the Development Director for Intercity Transit. For those of you who don't know me, I've been um, around public transportation for about 20 plus years of my 30 plus year career, year career in uh, um, public service. The rest of the time was um, in the trenches with both county and city level work. So I've mostly worked in the community development um, sector and I'll spend a lot of time on transportation planning. At Inner City Transit, I really focus on the, the strategic development of our, our services and support the, the implementation of our um, capital projects. So my group actually works on the grant development all the way through implementation uh, as well as procurements. And then the planning group actually plans, deploys services at inner city transit. So as I um, move forward today, feel free to, to stop and ask questions and I'll defer to the chair under the rules and guidances. But if I throw out an acronym accidentally, you can call me out. Um, I'm more than happy to back up and clarify. I sometimes do that. Um, I did wanna start off with just kind of reminding and setting the framework that this is this project is really kind of a tale of two projects. So we're talking primarily about the Thurston Smart Corridors project this morning, but we often hear transit signal priority and smart corridors commingled. And I just wanted to make sure that it was clear that these are very different, uh, but related projects. And both projects are moving forward right now with um, implementation plans. So smart corridors really focuses on the, the technology deployments that Vina mentioned that we've been investing in over this 15 to 20 year period um, in these corridors. And that would include support for um, vehicles, emergency service vehicles, pedestrian, bicycle, as well as transit. And under the Transit Signal Party project, this is really one of the operating strategies that we're looking to deploy on the smart corridors. And it was really the primary strategy that was identified early in the discussions going back almost 15 years as one of the strategies that could support increasing capacity and meeting some of the regional goals that we have. So next slide, please. So 
so a little bit more about how the project is uh, set up and how we've structured our work program. As uh, Dean mentioned, Intercity Transit um, is kind of the lead on this project, but we actually have three separate federal awards and the combined, um, we've combined these projects into a single scope of work. So the current work we're doing with our consultant team and the coordination um, through, through the regional partners is through this combined effort. So this, this mixes our original TSP equipment award, which we're still working on deploying, um, along with the new regional uh, smart corridor implementation work. And the combined total of these projects with the federal funds is just, just over $1.4 million. And about 800,000 of that is for the TSP project. And we have another 655,000, which is from the federal uh, portion of the smart corridors award. And the graphic really just shows the application area that Bean and I put together when we went forward with the application request. So really focusing on that Martin Way um, capital corridor that was originally identified in the early work under smart corridors. Next slide, please. Quick breakout of the funding. So, so here's how the smart corridors funds were awarded and inner city transit is the uh, providing the match for the regional project. And for the expenditures right now, we're underway with our scope of work with ITERA. So we've issued task orders um, for 140,000. We also have a $40,000 support contract through TRPC. They're providing some of those services under the, the regional project that we're using to bring people together. Um, we anticipate some additional work being awarded to TRPC as well as future ITERA work. So you can see a little breakout. And then um, approximately 340 would go into the field implementation. So that would be the deployments for that implementation phase. Next slide, please. So it, uh, Smart Corridors is a, a, a regional project and I, I wanted to stress the importance of our jurisdictional partnerships and the significance of the work that has happened previously and this would include approval of the more formal interlocal agreements that support moving forward um, with the project and the implementation vision for the smart corridors project. So the, the partnering for the project builds on the past work, creates a forum to better understand the agency partner concerns. It looks to balance those competing needs and it really moves the discussion forward, relying on data versus speculation. So a big part of the hesitancy, I think, in the past has been not having the the data to drive those decisions after we made those equipment investments. And I think that's important. So between 2016 and 2021, Intercity Transit's been out working with each jurisdiction individually to execute interlocal agreements in order to move this smart corridor and transit signal party um, program forward. And the agreements address how the details are handling, including costs, um, tracking equipment and field procedures so that we're making sure that we're being following the local agency requirements when we're working in the field dealing with technology. Next slide, please. Building off the, the coordination, I wanna recap quickly the project structure. So I mentioned that it is a regional project. So we, we took the lead on um, taking this project forward for the region, but this was done with support from all the local agencies and inner city transit, um, as I noted, was providing the, the matching funds for this project. So um, we are the project leader. This, this project is actually um, being managed on the, on the federal side through the Federal Transit Administration as far as the grant funds. TRPC, they're, they're contracted by IT to provide the coordination support um, for the project, but we've, we've pulled this together using the, the existing processes that our staffs are more familiar with working through. So we have a technical work group that includes all the jurisdictional partners that are currently in place. And uh, Intercity Transit has, as mentioned, interlocal agreements with each agency to support the transit signal party and smart corridor implementation work. And we're solely responsible for the hiring and managing of the uh, traffic engineering consultant, but all of the, the work is coordinated through the TWG, the technical work group. So, TRPC really takes the lead in pulling together the work group. And this is done kind of in coordination with Intercity Transit and the consultant team. Um, and this includes the staff from the, from the agencies and 
and the state agencies, local agencies that we know. So that's Inner City Transit, Lacey, Olympia, Tumwater, Thurston County, and, and WashDOT. The work group is set up so we can expand it to include other stakeholders, um, including emergency services. I could see that happening later. And their role is really to work through the technical issues relating to the project, be the, the, the liaison for their agency, um, and also provide the support for that coordination of the data collection and some of those other field activities and provide input to the project team. So I wanna transition and introduce you to the consultant team and their current work. So last summer we went out for an RFQ for the consultant selection process and we scoped the project to provide engineering support services for both the smart borders and the transit signal priority implementation projects. The plan was to work both of these side by side, taking advantage of the common elements um, between the projects for some cost efficiencies. The consultant selection process had um, direct support from our local agencies. So when we did the solicita solicitations, we brought all those uh, key staff back in to help pick the right mix of uh, support to help manage the different needs. Um, and that included TRPC, Lacey, Tumwater, and Olympia staff. And that process resulted in, a, in an executed agreement to hire the iTerrace team. And the Inner City Transit Authority approved um, their first task order under that contract back in October. And that first phase of work is currently underway. So I want to mention, so Mark Yand is on the meeting call today, so he can probably wave his hand at you. I'm not sure if I can see him right now, but... I know he's there and I, I think Jennifer uh, Martin was also gonna join us too from my terrace. Um, they're my backups in case I watch this. I, I do wanna mention that the my terrace team, when we looked at the, the selection process, they really had extensive experience with these deep technology projects. They have a lot of um, bandwidth in their technology um, deployments and history. They've worked on numerous nationally recognized transit signal party implementation projects, and they have a lot of familiar, familiarity with how these operations work. And then on the other side, we have parametrics, and um, Mark is a really well-regarded local project manager. He's experienced and trusted. He's well-known um, with many of our, our staff that have worked in the traffic um, arena for several years, so it's a really great partner, and he's really the boots on the ground person that's out there um, currently. One of the things we liked about the ITERIS approach when we made the consultant selection was a recognition of the prior work and partnerships. So this is just a kind of a quick graphic of their implementation approach. That they recognize the need for the working through the, the, that robust data review prior to developing the concepts and the fact that they identified a very practical approach to the project through this multi-scale demonstration or deployment process and then looking forward using scalable implementation strategies was, was a big factor in that. So they, they kind of outlined successful equaling scalable and that was a, a really important uh, project. Next slide. I mentioned earlier that we have work underway. So this is just a quick outline of the first task order, but we started off with kind of going back to where we left things off several years ago, which was updating that prior data collection. So Bina mentioned all the investments that have been made. This went back and picked up the, the missing gaps between where we were and where we are with those deployments of equipment in the field and looking at that technology review so that we could get everything back up to where, um, you know, to match the current field equipment. This requires quite a bit of coordination with the local jurisdictional partners and that the reason we're going through this effort is really this is kind of the basis for developing that full project roadmap. So they're kind of in the um, investigative phase and kind of bringing everything up to speed, but the next task order will really be um, defined around this project roadmap, which will develop the implementation strategy. So towards the end of spring, you'll be hearing more about kind of the testing and the field verifications that go along with this effort. Next slide. And I won't spend a ton of time on, on data collection, um, but when we reference data collection, we're look, looking at a wide range of data for the project. It's both 
intersection level data as well as corridor level data and includes everything from um, you know the transit schedule and ridership to signal timing plans so there's a lot of um, different data collection that's going on in the background and one of the long-term considerations you'll hear more about in these updates is our effort to automate data collection for the project so typical data collection for these types of implementation projects can be very labor intensive and tend to be very um, specific to the time and date where that data is collected. So I think if, if any of you have ever seen a poor guy on the corner of the street at 445 in the afternoon with a clipboard, a safety vest, two bottles of Gatorade, you'll kind of know how that uh, past data collection effort um, has been carried out and it is very labor intensive. In developing the implementation strategy, it's important that we develop a maintainable data collection tool that can be utilized to continue the evolution, use, and management of our smart corridors as we move forward. And uh, as we kind of proceed through, this is just a diagram of kind of the concept development and kind of shows examples of some of those um, items that we're looking at on the technical side. So looking at existing conditions and constraints, um, there's a lot of controller and TSP functionality tests that will be developed. And a lot of this is really going to be looked at in terms of our current um, localized de deployments of uh, signal timing plans and what can be done within those individual plans that promote different strategies. So we'll look at everything from the turn movements to uh, emergency vehicle disruptions and things like that when we're working through the concept development to make sure we're getting it right in our region. Next slide. And the, the last piece is we, we we're planning on going out to select um, test intersections. So right now we're looking at primarily the two, two main controller types that are used and picking out two locations that have kind of some of those operating issues that we know we want to work through that could be um, complexing as we work through this process so we can actually stress test the system a little bit before we come back to the table with some suggested strategies to work through. So we will be working through a pilot program to test the controller responses and functionality and validate that before we move forward with broader concepts. And as needed, we'll, we'll make adjustments and this could result in even recommendations for updates to equipment and communication and things like that that'll help connect the system a little bit better. Next slide. Here's just a quick look at the, the, the current schedule. And if you look at the benchmarks, we really kind of wrapped up that initial data collection phase and we're working through the, the uh, process kind of to develop these testing strategies. And we're looking at um, locking down kind of these test locations by later on this spring. So somewhere in the April, May timeframe, we're having really active discussions with the jurisdictions right now about what locations might work, what are those considerations and kind of simultaneously we've gone through the bench testing. All of this is really to go back and kind of develop what we have been calling that project roadmap, get, get our bearings on the project right now, make sure we do those checking with the jurisdictions, do that technical field work to verify, and then lay out that plan. And that will be happening side by side with our TSP work, which is actually, um, if you've heard some of our updates, we're about <laughs> the implementation of our CAD ABL, um, program and we hope to have our fleet ready by the end of this month and that's a key piece for us moving ahead with our equipment installation so getting our fleet ready so that we're ready to get the intersections ready by the time we've made decisions on um, where we're going to test it and I suspect we'll have some reporting uh, late summer on what some of those experiences are and where we're headed for some of those strategies and final slide not to say that we haven't had some, some project challenges. So I think you've heard this over and over again for the past couple of years, but um, COVID has created some changes into the, you know, what we refer to as the normal. And that includes with the traffic and transit ridership, two things that we want to look at while we're developing our, our project strategies. But it also um, kind of overlaps into how we work with each other, both in the field and kind of that tabletop discussion. So we've been doing really good with our remote meetings. Um, spring's coming, so I expect we'll have some opportunity to be working outside, which will be helpful. And we'll just continue to kind of um, 
track those challenges and move forward with the project under the current conditions. On the data collection side, uh, as I mentioned, those traditional methods of data collection really provide um, limited static um, data sets. And we're really looking forward with this project to see how we could use new technologies, um, our, you know, some of the artificial intelligence and the data as a service kind of options that maybe would provide a more diverse and rich set of data that would be more sustainable. So we're thinking of not just moving forward with the current project as a point in time, but making sure we provide ourselves with a foundation for smart corridors that the local staff can take on uh, and manage forward as things change and kind of adapt with it. So with that, I will turn it over. I'll ask uh, Bina to reprieve me along with Mark so that we're available to answer questions and turn it back over to the chair. Thank yeah. You. Thank you, Eric and Bina. So we have um, some time for questions and I'm looking for hands if anyone has questions. Okay, I see Council Member Gilman. Go ahead, Clark. Thank you, Hillary. First, I, I'm just excited that we've gotten this point with the traffic signal prioritization that I know it, it took some time for each of the jurisdictions to, to figure out and and get to uh, the technology that works together. It's anyhow. It's, that's I think that's just super exciting that we're we're moving forward. I'm I'm hoping that somebody might speak a little bit to how this Thurston Smart Corridors interacts with uh, an overlapping timeline on the Martin Way Corridor study, and just because that that seems like that's a potential sort of case study of some of these best practices. Um, I can speak to that. I mean, they're complementary. They certainly have the same geography and the same goals to um, move um, people through these corridors efficiently. They're um, they're not exactly synced up in terms. I mean, one's very technological, and so if nothing else, this one will really support Martin Way. I guess is how I'm thinking of it. I mean, they're working towards the same goals, and they're very complementary. But Martin Way is more looking at the physical framework around the corridor, how the lanes will be configured, that sort of thing. So we'll make sure they are synced up as we move forward. And, and Council Member Gilman, I, I get the same question on our end about how it lines up with our BRT program. So that if you think about um, smart corridor, corridor, some of the design and land use um, discussions that are happening around the Martin Way Corridor study, and then our future BRT service, which is that high frequency um, rapid transit model that we're trying to deploy on the corridor. I, I, they're like layers, they're like GIS layers, they kind of stack up. So we see these kind of complementing those operating strategies and those capital investments kind of complementing each other in time. But it's a great question. Yeah, there, there's quite a bit of overlap. Thank you. That's that's what I was. I just wanted to highlight that we have these multiple overlapping efforts at bringing smart technology and new thinking to our transportation corridors. I think it's really cool. Thank you. Thank you. And it looks like we have a question from Rick. Um, not a question, but a comment. Um, I appreciate. Uh, the inclusion of an EMS representative uh, as technical support to the working group earlier is always better. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Rick. John, you have a question? Yeah, uh, as time goes on, uh, as we all know that uh, by 2030, uh, there's going to be nothing but electronic cars. Most of those electronic cars are going to be like Tesla. Tesla is self-driving and they're going through all of their planning right now. Uh, will these smart corridors actually be able to adapt to that type of technology? I think that's the goal, John. I'm not sure where we're headed exactly in the timing of that, but that would be the goal as we keep um, moving with the times kind of with this adaptive technology as we proceed. So I think this is, if we were able to fund kind of the new technology, this smart quarters was trying to turn it on initially. And then I think we'll have to do our m &O as we go along to kind of adapt to the times. So that's as vague as I can be without getting yeah. into trouble, I suppose. I mean, I guess so, we don't know what technologies they'll need, so we may have to make further investments, but the uh, goal is second, to stay up. That's my second it. question. Uh, is since, since what you guys are saying, has anybody reached out to Tesla Corporation 
to just even open communications to get an idea of what's, what's going to happen, because it is going to happen. Uh, I, as I talked with, uh, with Andy Ryder, uh, Dave Watterson, both of them exactly the same thing, two different locations. They both have uh, Teslas and they both say yes on the highway that uh, the Tesla works real well as far as self-driving. It's just in the city, it gets a little confused sometimes. Um, that's where most of the most of the driving is going to be. So if we can get in touch with these people to find out how to make it all work and then get uh, back with Google, which they used to have their cars come out and map the roads, it might be a really big help. I, I, I'd like to quickly comment on that. Um, as folks might remember, I'm, I'm participating on the, the state's um, Cooperative Automated Transportation Infrastructure Work Group. And this is something, Council Member O'Callaghan, that they're talking a lot about at the state level. And, and actually, what we've heard from industry is that that's the level that they'd like to be working to begin with, because there's they would hate to see, and it would be inc incredibly expensive is if every individual company developed their own technologies, because mm -hmm. as you point out, ultimately we're going to want <laughs> signals talking to cars, right? Talking to vehicles. Yeah. And we're going to want some consistency in the way that happens. And so the industry is, is working that at the state and federal level. Um, they're, they're, way pretty far off from from that at, at this point in terms of identifying the technologies 5g is a big po uh, point that the industry talks about being kind of a, a a necessary precursor to really getting that uh vehicle to infrastructure communication going i could throw in john the um on the transit side, so I won't, I won't, I won't speculate further on Mark's comments. I was going to say on the transit side, when you look at our region and public transportation, we've been working on a mo model of, of total access to transit, and it focuses on that rider experience. So if you think about the connected bus, we have communication on where the bus is. We can talk to our customers about, and we can potentially look at making those running times more efficient by communicating with the traffic signal controller and they can get real time updates currently on their phone about how that service is running. So the expectation of service delivery is, um, you know, more predictable and a little more of a lively customer experience in that regard. I think we're really there um, through this project. We'll see kind of that connected experience kind of exemplified on the transit side. So of course I'm going to advocate transit, but uh, um, hopefully that, that makes you feel like it's a little bit of that is here today and we're working on it. Well, that, that, uh, there was a presentation about two years ago on, uh, on buses and how it's going to interconnect. So I understood all of that part. Uh, but what we're not hearing a whole lot is the, is personal vehicles and how it's going to interact. And you have a whole lot more personal vehicles out there than you have public vehicles and it, it all has to mesh together. Otherwise we're going to see accidents. Uh, one other thing real quick, and then I'll get off of here. Uh, as you guys, most of you know, I'm a political geek, and I listen to all kinds of stuff all over the place. And I accidentally found a, uh, uh, now I can't think of his name, Microsoft, what's his name? Bill Gates. Uh, years ago, he put on a seminar with this type of uh, technology, except his was all Bluetooth connectivity. Uh, has anybody reached out to Microsoft to see what the, what their version is? Might be worth looking into, because like I said, I spent an hour and a half, and that's when I first really started getting interested in all of this kind of stuff. And I, because I could see that it was actually coming down the pike, and this is the place to start bringing it up. I can just say a few things on that, Council Member Callahan. And I think it's a great question and appreciate that. There are standards for what's called vehicle to infrastructure communication. Mark mentioned one, which is 5G. There's also DSRC. As part of our project, you know, we're not ins installing those types of communications, but we are trying to be forward looking. And the way that we're being forward looking is looking at what kind of services are needed to support that in the future. And an, an important part of that is the data if you don't have the data, for example, to notify a vehicle that there's a ped there or some activity is going on, then you can't really utilize those services. 
So one of the things that we're doing is, is trying to be forward looking and thinking about what services might be needed beyond just traffic signal priority. Thank you. Thanks all. Great questions. Um, thank you to Eric and Vina and also the additional guests, Mark and Jennifer for joining us as well. And I think we're gonna move on to the next agenda item. It is probably a very popular one. So I wanna make sure we have plenty of time. We're gonna hear from um, some guests from the cities, Leonard Bauer, Rick Walk, and Mike Matlock from Olympia, Lacey and Tumwater respectively. And I guess I wanna pause and make sure, and Mark, I think you're introducing this one, right? Okay. Correct. I want to make sure since we've got three folks from three jurisdictions that everybody's cool with waiting until the end of the presentation for questions. I really want to make sure that we give everyone equitable time to speak and that um, we're hearing kind of from all the presenters. Presenters, does that work for you guys? Wherever you I'll, are. I'll speak for them. It does. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Okay, great. So we have allotted 30 minutes for this presentation and 20 minutes for discussion. And I will go ahead and hand it off to you, Mark. Great. Thank you. I'm going to start sharing my screen. I, I'm excited to bring this one um, to council. This is one that, that I've had a lot of council members ask about. Uh, folks, well, we've got a lot of new people, so they might not know that um, back in 2019, we uh, started working with uh, Olympia, Lacey, and Tumwater through a, and when I say we, TRPC, um, through a commerce grant to look at, to, to uh, sorry, to develop a housing action plan um, for our region and then for implementation at each of the local levels. And so what, what I've been asked about it is just kind of how is that going? What are we seeing? Um, what I hear from members is that uh, there's a lot of discussion in, in different settings about uh, unhoused individuals in our region, but not as much discussion about what all are we doing for housing affordability and attainability and to build up that housing stock. And the, and the answer is there's, there's a lot going on. Um, and uh, we've got three of the wisest individuals I get to work with uh, to tell you about what's going on in the, in the three cities, uh, three big cities um, this morning. But I'm going to start it off with a little bit of a look at what's going on um, across our region in relation to housing. And this is, it comes from, whoops, data that, um, that we regularly uh, collect here at TRPC. And so... One of the things I mean we've we've talked about is just that need to build up housing stock of all kinds, and so we're looking at um, dwelling units permitted per year, and these are all kinds: single family, multifamily, and manufactured homes since 2000. And uh, what we what we see is prior to the recession, there was a lot of construction going on, um, and, and then. We saw a huge drop as the recession took over, and we really hadn't recovered from the, that impact of the recession. We had some years of, of peaks and valleys of construction, but now we're starting to see, and we've had just in 2021, um, our, our largest year in terms of uh, dwelling units permitted since the recession. So definitely going in the right direction it just in terms of overall increasing the housing stock across the region. Another thing that we're definitely looking at when we talk about affordability or attainability is how much does it cost for renters? And this is one that, that we've certainly seen reported on in the Olympian and, and such quite a bit um, because we've seen a steady increase in that cost of, of apartment rentals. But Hopefully this is a trend because since 2018, we've seen that level off and even start to go down in 2021, that, that average apartment rent. Um, like say, we've, we've definitely got a lot more multifamily units that have come online. And so hopefully this is a trend that we're gonna see continuing in terms of that, that leveling off of that average apartment rent. 
Another important factor is uh, what's that median home sales price for the single family homes. And this is another area that I'm, I'm sure comes as no surprise to anyone. We've been on quite a, quite a upward trajectory in terms of that median home sales price. Um, and we're, we're getting close to that, that 400,000 mark. And so this certainly is challenging to the affordability and the attainability of, of folks looking for um, to purchase a single family home. One of the pieces that uh, is important to consider in this are cost burden households. And a cost burden household is um, one that is earning less than 80% of the median in, uh, household income in Thurston County and spends uh, more than 30% of that income on housing. And we also look at severely cost burden. That's the same, they're earning less than 80% of the median household income and spending more than 50% on, on their housing. Uh, and what we're seeing is a, a steady increase there. I mean, since 1990, uh, the, the number of cost burden households has gone up 87%. Um, but we also notice so is our population, obviously. And so, the, what we see is the percentage of overall households that are either cost burden or severely cost burden hasn't changed a great deal. And yet, as our population grows and those numbers grow, um, that's putting just more of a strain on our system because we have more households that are challenged to provide for um, their basic needs, including housing. And so this is definitely a, an area of concern. It's worth mentioning that for Sustainable Thurston um, and, and folks that, that may not be aware, Sustainable Thurston was an effort of TRPC um, that com completed in uh, 2013. And we had a, a lot of targets for different sectors. And we have a target for cost burden households, which is by 2035, we'll have 10% uh, of household uh, fewer than 10% of households being cost burdened and fewer than 5% of households being severely cost burdened. So this data is concerning in that we're, we're just not making uh, a lot of progress in reducing that percentage of cost burdened households. And obviously that relates directly to that median household income. And We've seen a, a steady increase, which looks like a, a good sign. Um, and yet, when you for these data from 2000 to 2020, we've seen that ha that household income increase by about 2.6 percent per year. But at that same time, inflation <coughs> has been at 2.3 percent per year on average. And so, even though incomes are growing. They're not growing much quicker than inflation is. And as we all know, um, we're seeing upticks in inflation. In 2021, it, we saw an inflation rate of 4.7%. And so far in 2022, we're at 7.5%. And so if, if those trends continue, then we're actually gonna be losing ground in, in terms of that purchasing power of that median household income. And so from a regional level, kind of sum it up in that we're, made, we're seeing uh, good progress in terms of the number of dwelling units that we're bringing online. We're, we're hopefully starting to see a good trend in terms of that cost of rental units. Um, and, and things are not quite as rosy when we're talking about um, income and cost burden households. We still have quite a ways to go. And so that's a snapshot of just kind of the context from a regional basis. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Rick Walk to talk about uh, Lacey specifically. Great, Rick. Uh, thank you, Mark. And that, that's a, a great setup. And as I uh, transition in, I, one of the great things we're, we're working from now is the effort that we all put in to develop um, our individual housing action plans. Because the reason why that's so unique is while we're separate jurisdictions, we have, a, as everybody knows, an integrated regional market. So we're able to take uh, all the baseline information 
look at all the housing demographics, kind of what's going on in the market, the household incomes, all that uh, information. So we're all coordinated and working from the, the same baseline of information. And so with that developers, we have a consistent housing action plans for all the jurisdictions to try to tackle those problems that uh, Mark just highlighted with some of those uh, great statistics. Um, and with that, we have you know basically six strategies that came out of those housing action plans to try to accomplish going forward. And uh, in a quick summary, those include uh, increasing the supply of affordable housing, make it easier to access housing and stay housed, expand the overall supply, uh, increase the variety of housing choices, and continue to build on resources and collaboration, as well as establishing a uh, permanent source of funding for low-income housing. And one thing I do want to make, we have really just, uh, you know, a lot of people think there's just one housing market, but there's really two niches of that. There's the uh, private sector market rate housing, and then there's also the low-income housing that usually has some sort of uh, government-level funding to help support that effort that can be built by either nonprofits or uh, private developers that specialize in low-income housing production. So. Um, with my set of slides, I'm going to try to take a, a quick run through some Lacey specific information, um, at a high level, talk about some of our recent housing trends, a little bit what we see in market dynamics, uh, talk about a little bit past successes and how long it takes to kind of see those successes, and then um, some of the early implementation items we are taking out of the recent adopted housing action plan. Uh, so with that, um, this slide here to start off with is looking back to 2015 and the housing starts that occurred in Lacey. And um, with those housing starts, you can see with the yellow column being single family detached and, and manufactured homes and the orange column um, being multifamily units, those are the two dominant housing forces. Uh, what you can't see in those charts or, or harder to see are the duplex, triplex and fourplex units, a lot of times called the missing middle, as well as uh, accessory dwelling units, all various types of housing actually we're trying to promote uh, going forward. Uh, since 2015, uh, that total housing unit production uh, that you see on those charts totals just, just over 3,600 units. Um, one of the things you see transition from 2015 going through to 2018 is you see that shift into having more multifamily unit production. And that's one of the challenges we've seen in, in the city of Lacey uh, going back to 2000 is we were heavily dominated with single family detached and um, small lot housing development. And we didn't get a lot of multifamily production during those years. And now we're starting to see that market shift for the infill projects and starting to see more density, which is a good sign because we're getting more variety, but also too, with that pent up demand, that's what you see in some of those um, um, rental numbers that Mark just went through in terms of cost of an apartment. But also you might see that downward slide we just noticed as we're getting the more capacity in the system, there might be seeing a, that that cost of a, a of a rental unit maybe start to come down, and we'll we'll track those numbers going forward. Um, just kind of a context too that really emphasize the dominance of the single family market. Um, the numbers that we had in Lacey going back to between 2000 and 2014, we issued permits for uh, just over 5,600 single family detached homes. And in that same time period, a total of 700 multifamily units. So you see in 2021, uh, we have uh, more multifamily unit starts uh, this year or this last year than we did all of the time between 2000 and 2014. And what's a, a good sign going forward is in the pipeline, we have um, that pipeline is a, everything from our pre-submission stage to starting the land use entitlement into the civil uh, and grading permit stage we have about 2,600 uh, more units in the pipeline that we'll see come forward in two to five years. And I think that's an important thing for a, a lot of people to remember is by the time we get to that building permit issuance, it's just an you know, 18 to 24 month lay time from the time somebody starts their project, goes through that permitting process and starts breaking ground and pulling that, that building permit. So there is something to keep in mind too is, is while we may take some actions and policy actions, it does take time for those to be put into the ground. Uh, next slide, uh, please, Mark. So this is kind of another way to look at some of the dynamics in the market. Uh, we, we look at the uh, household income, rate of inflation, the housing costs, and medium income. But in Lacey, um, we, we kind of start tracking how much uh, of uh, house sales supply or, or inventory is on the market at any one point in time. And as a point of reference, 
uh, a traditional healthy supply of uh, homes on the market for sale is generally about a four month supply, three to four months. And you can tell in 2017, uh, those two lines on there, the blue line is, represents the uh, growth in the uh, median sales price of a single family home and the yellow line being just uh, inventory and supply. Uh, they were about the, at the same point of a $250,000 um, medium uh, sales price and a, a two and a half month supply. And remember in 2017, um, two and a half month supply is, is still below what was tra traditionally considered a healthy supply. And that could be tied to the impact of that 2008 recession that Mark, Mark mentioned. But it, interesting going forward since then is that um, you see those lines starting to diverge. As our median price uh, increase, you see the, the weeks of supply or inventory on the market decrease to the point we uh, want to start trying to bring those lines together. And that kind of speaks to uh, the population growth, uh, the influence of outside markets, the greater King County, and then what we have for capacity. And then in terms of that supply, it's not just new construction, it's also existing housing on the market being resold what we see is less movement between you know, somebody buying that first home and moving it up to the next home or somebody that, that um, is an empty nester wanting to downsize. We're not seeing that movement within the existing housing inventory. And that's something too that we wanna try to um, um, enable going forward. Uh, next slide, Mark. So this is a really kind of taking a, a, a step aside because again, when we talk about adopting these uh, strategies and implementation in the housing action plan, a lot of questions I've been getting recently from, from the community and, and our council is, well, when are we going to start seeing effect? What are those numbers looking like? And sometimes it will take some time to see the effects of the policy being enacted today and implemented. Um, this is kind of what we look at as a corridor success story in Lacey. Uh, this is the area that's known as the Martin Way East Corridor. And so point of reference, um, Marvin Road is located to the left of the screen, off the screen. And the big rooftop, um, there is the Lacey Costco. So this is the area of uh, Martin Way to uh, Deutero Road. And you have River Ridge High School that's just often unshaded in, in the bottom of the area. So this is a part of the Martin Way corridor. And uh, as we know, we're also studying the Martin Way corridor for everything um, east of Marvin Road. But this is an area where we had some success implementing the 94 plan, but it took some time. Uh, we had some initial apartments built in 97, the Callan apartments, but the majority of this area built out over the last 10 years or so. And as you can see, it's really been a success because we were able to get um, the multifamily residential um, we, uh, on a gross density of the 176 acres. There's about 13 units to the acre. Uh, if you just count the residentially developed properties, we received just over 17 units to the acre. But it also is that mixed use district because uh, in that district, we also have um, just over uh, 325,000 square feet of commercial office, professional services and restaurants. And so there is a success out there in the Martin Way corridor. And that's one thing too, as we study the uh, other portion of the Martin Way corridor and that Martin Way corridor project, how are we having some successes in one place and the other? And how do we help facilitate opportunity for more mixed use, um, higher urban style density development along that corridor? Because also, too, as everybody knows, that's our primary transit corridor. Uh, next slide, please, Mark. And so some of the housing actions that we are implementing in Lacey, uh, one of the first things we did um, is adopt a low density zone consolidation. Uh, and so we had two low density zoning classifications for single family, a zero to four and a three to six. Our zero to four uh, class, uh, classification uh, allowed up to four units per the acre but larger lots and didn't allow duplexes and triplexes. Where our three to six allowed more, um, some um, duplexes and did not allow triplexes. So we combined those into one zone. So one residential zone at up to six units to the acre and it now allows duplexes, triplexes and it's really geared towards more of that infill development. And, um, and so that's something that was just recently adopted by our city council this last fall. Um, but also too, as we go forward and see change, that'll be gradual change. It'll be projects here and there. And so we won't see the full effect of that until three to five years out, which we will continue to track and monitor. Another action that the, the city council has taken based on the housing action plan is implemented our um, fee waiver program. Uh, prior to this action, the, the city waived fees for nonprofit low-income housing providers. 
as well as uh, other nonprofit such as the Boys and Girls Club for um, uh, uh, building permit and uh, um, mitigation fees for transportation. We expanded that to include the um, private sector uh, that is looking uh, developer that is looking to develop low income housing. So we will allow if they commit to building low income housing and put a deed restriction on that property. We will waive those fees. And another piece that we're working on is how to address the utility connection fees, sewer and water, because as you can see, that fee waiver totals about six thousand, just over six thousand dollars in, in per, uh, fee costs. But the larger chunk is those utility fees, and we're looking on strategy and how to address that. And and just as a quick side note on the utility fees, one of the biggest challenges when you start looking at higher density or multifamily projects, it's a little different impact on the utility fee um, uh, for those projects than it is a single family because you're paying for multiple units all at once. And so that creates a financial pressure on that developer to try to try to finance that. Uh, it could be a two, three million dollar cut hit right at the time they pull that permit. And so that's one of the things, again, we're going to look at and try to figure out how we can address that going forward. And then of course we have the pre-approved accessory dwelling units. Um, this was a, a, a great program where we uh, created the um, um, pre-approved plans working with a, a local architect, also partnering with uh, Olympia and, and Tomwater, with Glitter and Mike, as they develop plans too. So we have a set, I think a total now six uh, pre-approved plans amongst the jurisdictions that we can share to allow um, our residents and homeowners to be able to reduce the cost in, able, in order to um, um, develop ADUs on their properties and try to create more of an inventory of uh, smaller and, and lower cost housing. Um, next slide, please. And then some of the other actions that we've been uh, working on and as we extended our multifamily tax exemption in the Midtown District, uh, we had our first uh, developer that took uh, advantage of that. Uh, this is MGR's development. It's the Sixth Avenue mixed use project right on uh, Sixth Avenue. And if you drive down Sixth Avenue, you see it uh, vertical and under construction now. And with that extension of the multifamily tax exemption, we should be receiving another application coming in in the next month for another 350 unit mixed use building in our Midtown area right around Woodland Square Loop and adjacent to Hunterman Park. Uh, we also looked at our parking requirements, especially for multifamily, and went from the, the old traditional uh, one and a half space per unit to now a more focused uh, space, number of space per bedroom uh, count, very similar to what uh, Tomwater has done, and we kind of use that as a, an example. We also allow reduced parking depending on the location of that, um, um, uh, that residential project, if it's close to transit, close to other services and has on-street parking, there's other ways to reduce the parking, which then reduce the cost to develop and potentially uh, create the more affordable housing as well as a higher count. And then of course we have the energy efficient audit program that we're looking at, because one of the things that came out of the housing action plan is you have a lot of existing rentals out there, older stock that need to have energy upgrades. Uh, a lot of times the tenants have to pay those utility bills either directly or through their rents and trying to work with landlords to incorporate some energy efficiencies to reduce that utility um, that maybe help people stay in place. Um, that's also nice because it also uh, achieves some of the goals of our climate action uh, plan as well. So that, that uh, that's a quick, hopefully a quick hit over the, the Lacey, what's going on in Lacey, and I'll turn it over to Leonard next. Great, thanks Rick. Uh, I'm Leonard Bauer, the City of Olympia Community Planning Development Director. Uh, it's good to see a lot, all of you this morning and uh, appreciate the chance to, to share a bit about Olympia. I really appreciated Mark and Rick's kind of overviews of the market dynamics. Uh, I don't plan to repeat those. Uh, those, those affect our entire region and, and so you've got a pretty good picture of that. So we'll focus here on uh, Olympia's housing action plan, some of the actions we have that are building on previous actions that we've done, such as the increasing the variety of uh, middle type housing and the multifamily tax exemption that Rick mentioned, Lacey and Tumblr also have. Uh, we've also had a downtown residential uh, exemption from parking requirements for, for quite a few years. And uh, as you'll see, we'll be looking at, at that for other areas of the city too. So uh, just to start out, our housing action plan, as Rick mentioned, has six strategies. Uh, this is, uh, they're all here in front of you. Won't go over all of them, but for today's uh, purposes, since we're focusing a little bit more on the uh, market end of housing, 
and, the, and, and market provision of housing through the private sector, I'll focus on the two that, with the arrows here, expanding the overall supply by making it easier to build all types of housing projects and increasing the variety of housing choices. So these are the two areas we're trying to really work on. So a few of the highlights of, of some of the actions that we have underway uh, right now. Um, reviewing fees and regulations to reduce some of the barriers to housing construction. And this is really especially focused on scaling our uh, regulations and requirements for uh, the size of the uh, development. So what we found is that um, we've, we're disproportionately affecting those smaller residential projects because we have thresholds for different requirements such as uh, frontage improvements, sidewalks, curbs, street improvements, that sort of thing rather than having those scaled to the size of the project. So from a uh, private developer's perspective, it makes it a little bit harder to pencil smaller projects and, and pushes them towards a, a higher density, which is great in the areas we plan for that higher density. But in other areas of the city where it's a little bit lower density zoning or mid-density mid zoning, it becomes much harder to do those infill projects. So we, we have four major areas in our engineering design standards that we're reviewing now and looking for, to change. Uh, to help address that situation. Similarly, uh, rehabbing existing buildings, and this is true not just for residential, but for uh, commercial and, and other uses as well, uh, similar types of thresholds that uh, might make it difficult to um, do what we'd like, which is to have these infill buildings uh, rehabilitated or renovated or added on to to get more units or, or greater square footage. And finally, as we said, parking requirements uh, we have had, as I said, a, a downtown uh, exemption from required residential parking uh, in place for many years. It's been a key factor in some of the uh, downtown projects we've seen coming forward. While they do provide their parking, it's their own option at, and at their own uh, kind of rate based on their read of the market for parking. We're looking now in this year, uh, we received a $100,000 grant from Department of Commerce to uh, look at our uh, corridors where there's frequent transit and uh, potentially reduce those parking requirements as well as potentially other areas of the city. Next slide, Mark, thanks. Another major uh, effort we have this year is um, a feasibility study or a review study, perhaps is a better word, of our multifamily tax exemption program. Rick mentioned this earlier that uh, Lacey has seen some recent projects. Um, many of our downtown uh, projects in the last five to 10 years have also uh, taken advantage of this program, which um, really has two purposes in the state law that authorizes this. One is to incentivize housing development where a city has planned for it, but it hasn't been realized. And then the second is to look at um, affordable housing and trying to in increase low income housing um, through uh, this exemption, which is actually what the exemption is, is an exemption from the value of the new residential development being exempted from, from included, being included in the property tax. So it's not an entire property being exempted from property tax, but it's the residential portion of the improvements, that cost that they made in improvements to that property is exempt for a certain number of years, either eight or 12, depending on the program. So what we're looking at, uh, and the city council appropriated uh, $50,000 to look at a study to look at our program, which is focused in downtown and the close in portions of our transit corridors look at are there other areas of the city that might be appropriate for this, uh, potentially around the Capitol Mall area or the Pacific Martin Way area, as well as downtown. Look at how it can be more effective in incentivizing low income housing and test our market. We've had a lot of market changes as has been pointed out already in this uh, presentation. So how, how can we make sure this is aligned well with our local market at this point to provide the incentive where it's needed um, and not provide a break to developers where it may not be needed, where they may be built, where we may get the housing anyway. So that's, uh, that's what this study is for. Uh, next slide. And then um, I mentioned the Capitol Mall area just a moment ago. That's one of three um, high density neighborhoods. You can see the cross hatching here. And this map is our uh, comprehensive land use plan map. And there's three areas we've identified with that black cross hatching, uh, Martin, um, Pacific and Lily, that triangle on the east side, the downtown area, 
And then the third one is in uh, what we call a capital mall triangle, you know, the Cooper Point, Black Lake, and Harrison Triangle. Um, we will be focusing on that one this year through another grant we received from uh, the Department of Commerce to, to do a subarea plan for that area, which in our comprehensive plan has called for uh, infill housing as well as upgrading to continually for the commercial in that area uh, and try to get that into a more of a mixed use neighborhood. Uh, we have the support of the property owners and, and in that area to, to look at this and we're anxious, we're anxious to get started. We are actually reviewing consultant um, proposals for this project as, as we speak today. Um, and uh, that will also include an upfront in, environmental analysis. So an environmental impact statement through what's called a planned action, which basically does all of the environmental review upfront rather than requiring that of each developer as they come in on a case-by-case -case basis for their parcel. This does a few things. It, it definitely helps uh, the, the incentivize the development because it's not putting that cost on those developers. The community as a whole through this grant is doing that review. Um, but it also helps us look more holistically at the whole area for environmental impacts rather than property by property and helps us identify upfront what those improvements might be that would help provide those amenities for that walkable uh, mixed use center that we're looking for. So we're looking for a lot more housing in this area over time. And as Rick said, these are, these are things that take a while to move forward. I would anticipate uh, having this plan uh, done by about mid 2023, and then hopefully we'll see some uh, development enter into that, that uh, permit pipeline for that area that might include housing. And uh, of course, adapting some of that vacant commercial to housing as well. Go ahead, Mark, thank you. So those are some of the major actions we're taking into the Housing Action Plan. I do wanna share a little bit of uh, information about our permit pipeline. Um, I didn't, didn't include the historic data uh, as Rick did, but just this is a snapshot of um, a quarterly report we provide to our city council members of what's in the permit pipeline around residential. Um, and this is the last one we sent to them in December and the data is as of November 22nd of 2021. Um, at the various stages of development, there's the pre-application process, which is a conference that we have with uh, potential applicants. Um, then the, once the permit comes in, it's under review. The third category is when, once they get their building permits are under construction. And then the fourth category we include are just recently occupied the number of units in the past six months that have been occupied, projects that are finished and people are living in those. You can see, uh, our total units um, is uh, about uh, similar to what uh, Rick was mentioning for Lacey of, of getting closer to 3,000 for multifamily. Uh, about 300 of those are in the subsidized low income category. So the others would remain in the market. And we also included um, shelter, a homeless shelter capacity because we have a sh homeless shelter project being built on Martin Way right now. And I also break out how many are downtown because that's that one area that we uh, focus, have focused our, most of our incentives on so far. So this is multifamily. And then uh, one more slide, uh, Mark, for single family lots that are being created. I think this is significant to look at because um, since the recession, we have not had uh, in Olympia a lot of new single family lots created. And, and I think this, this um, helps uh, you know, show that market trend that we've had of not, not a lot of new single family and it hasn't really kept up with that population growth. But in the last year or two, we have seen a significant uptick in the number of lots that are being created here in Olympia and some of the parcels that are remaining. Um, so you can see here there's 495 total lots currently in the, being created in the, in the review process right now. Just for some perspective, the last, I believe three or four years we have, been in the range of 50 to 100 new lots each year. So this is a significant uptick back to the production that we were seeing earlier in the 2010s, um, right after the recession and going back to before the recession. So it's been a little bit of recovery for single family lots, uh, which, we, which we're happy to see as well. So I'll stop there and turn it over to Mike to give a Tim Water summary, and then we can have some questions after that. Thank you, Leonard, and thank you for the invitation to talk about some of the work that Tumwater has been doing lately on around affordable housing. Uh, like Leonard, I'm tying this back to the actions that are in the housing action plan for Tumwater that the council adopted as well. And the strategy one is just increasing supply of permanent income restricted housing. 
And uh, we've done a number of, council's done a number of actions around that recently. Uh, for low-income housing, they have reduced fees by about 50%, meaning transportation and park impact fees, permitting fees, and water connection fees. So that's a pretty significant reduction there all alone. We've also got an, a number of, uh, just like Olympia, uh, we've got a number of multifamily tax exemptions that are spread around transit routes primarily. And we have our first project that actually used the 12 year exemption. It's the Bishop Road Apartments, which is just south of uh, Home Depot and east of Little Rock Road, about 141 units and 29 of those are, are affordable units. So. We're very pleased by that because sometimes you adopt these policies and, and no one comes and this time it happened pretty quickly. We also periodically or continuously work with uh, nonprofits such as Homes First to kind of connect people with housing. Uh, we'll sometimes we'll work with property owners that have uh, housing units that have seen better days and work with them to connect partners to rehab that housing and get it back into the housing supply and connect it with people most in need. And one thing we did a long time ago, actually in 2009, was we uh, did a manufactured home park zone. So all of our manufactured home parks in Tumwater are actually in a zoning category that only allows that use. So those uses can't turn over as you see sometimes in a, in a more blazing market, they'll turn over and those people will have um, issues finding somewhere to go. You can't really move those units usually. They've been there a long time. And so that was kind of important as well. We actually got sued on that one and prevailed. So that was, uh, was a bit of a task, but we got through that and it's been very successful. Next slide, please, Mark. Thank you. Uh, strategy two is making it easier for households to access housing and stay housed. We are working with uh, our city council and a subgroup currently on tenant protection regulations. And uh, we're working through that. We're kind of reevaluating a little bit because we were working on it and then the state legislature passed many of those measures, which is good news on a statewide basis. And so we're sifting through that and seeing where there are gaps currently that we need to do and that we're able to do. We're working with Tumwater schools and nonprofits like together as partners to link low-income residents to housing. And we're also, of course, working with the Regional Housing Council uh, to commit more resources to Tumwater for regional housing efforts. Strategy three is expand the overall housing supply. Um, we've done a number of things here. And just before I get into that, we've, it's been kind of a, and the recession hit us too in 2008, just like it did everyone. And we started recovering out of that with single family house construction. And what I read is that the first things that were coming back were multifamily projects, but they weren't in Tumwater. We weren't seeing any of that. We were getting a lot of uh, single families. We've continued to run 140 to 150 units per year since things picked up after the recession, and we still are. We weren't seeing really very much multifamily at all. And I think the reason for that was, is that at least for Tumwater, the rents weren't sufficient to make those projects feasible. And we've obviously have passed that mark now because we're starting to see a lot of multifamily development happening now. So the council added incentives in the zoning code to build permanently affordable housing units. They increased density and height in some areas. They reduced lot sizes for single family and reduced parking requirements for multifamily projects, particularly those that are on transit corridors. We've also increased the uh, State Environmental Policy Act or SEPA exemptions, where um, those exemptions reply to, do you need to do a checklist or not and go through that DNS project process. And we've increased that to 60 units for multifamily projects and nine lots for short plats. This has the effect of uh, reducing the timeline for projects a little bit and the cost as well. We don't really lose anything in terms of envir environmental protection either because uh, you know, 20 years ago in Tumwater, we used SEPA fairly extensively still to fill in gaps when projects review where our regulations didn't cover everything. And our regulatory process and regime has gotten sophisticated enough now that we don't see that very often anymore. So I don't think we lose anything there for environmental protection. 
And we're also promoting options to increase housing affordability, like accessory housing dwelling units. We tagged on to the, the good work that Lacey started there, as Rick mentioned, and Olympia. And so we've got those plans available too. And we're also encouraging the restoration of abandoned houses. We will sometimes be in contact with property owners that have houses that have been abandoned for some time. And sometimes we've been able to broker projects between Homes First, for example, and and housing that, that needs rehabilitated to get those housing units back into the market. So in terms of expected development, what I've done here is I've put in um, single family and multifamily developments that are reason, reasonably certain are gonna happen in the next two to three years. As you all know, that's, that's kind of, there's a little bit of guesswork involved in that. Sometimes projects seem like they're gonna go and they don't, or they seem like they're not gonna go and they do but we really expect about 838 single family lots to come online in the next two to three years. We still have pretty abundant land resources for platting and about 689 multifamily units over that same period. So significant amount of uh, residential growth in Tumwater going on. That totals about 1500 units overall. And in addition to that, and this little graphic here is something called Yorkshire, which is just north of Tumwater Boulevard and west of I-5. And that's something we've only done feasibility review on currently. And sometimes those will go by the wayside, but this one seems in feasibility to be pretty real. And that's a, for Tumwater, that would be the largest multifamily project we've ever done, which is almost 1,300 units in multifamily in that one project alone. So it'll be interesting to see if that comes to fruition. But uh, just a lot going on in terms of development and uh, I, I'm glad to see that happening. I'm a little concerned if it goes up too much more, we're gonna be just simply overrun. So uh, right now we're holding our own. And uh, that completes my portion of this. So back to you, Mark. Thank you. And uh, Chair Seidel, that's the end of the presentation. And also just so you know, I can keep my executive director's report uh, very short to provide a little more time for questions on this as well, if need be. Great, thank you. And I'm um, hoping we can just like shrink a few of the following items too to leave some time for questions. So we're running a little bit past schedule, but I know folks might have questions. So I'm gonna open the queue. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I will keep the queue rolling. So I see Robin first, go ahead, Robin. Yeah, Mike, I wanted to ask, how long has Tumwater had your multifamily tax exemption going? It sounds like it's somewhat recent. It's fairly recent. We started oh, probably three or four years ago. We did our first one. And actually one of the ones we've, we've expanded that, the council expanded that over time. And the one that's actually come through is actually one of the ones that's more recent. So when we did this, we weren't at all certain, you know, with this five years, 10 years, you just never know. And we're, we're pleased that it's happened that quickly. Yeah, I think Lacey's had ours for eight years. Is that right, Rick? And we just now have our first project that's actually taking advantage of the exemption. Yeah, and we, we, we um, and Lacey, the, the, the target was trying to implement the Woodland District Strategic Plan in the Midtown area and create more housing there. So our multifamily tax and was focused on that particular location. Uh, so it's not a, a broader geographical area. And so that was the first residential project to actually come in in that area since 2008. Thanks. Chris, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, thank you. I have one for Leonard because it involves the area he was talking about around the west side there. Um, as you know, that there's a perplexity in dealing with uh, folks that live in trailer homes, mostly the elderly. And one of the areas that you're looking at there uh, on the road to go to the Capitol Medical Center from the Capitol Mall has one of those units that's slowly getting depopulated. And I eventually assume it will go into the housing that you're speaking of. And I was just wondering if you've taken into consideration the fact that, you know, this is displacing some of our low income neighbors, even though I, I understand that the owner can do what the owner can do with trailer parks because they're not fixed units. But how are you addressing that problem? Because there is displacement going on. Thank you. 
Uh, yes, uh, this the capital mall sub area uh, actually doesn't include that area, but of course, as we do a sub area plan, we're going to want to look at areas that are just outside of it as well, and so that that is a uh, a challenging one. We we actually have had a um, application from that friendly village to um, add some spaces in that um, park. So they they actually are increasing the number of spaces there right now. Uh, that doesn't um, mean that, as you point out, maybe in the long run there might be uh, some displacement. And we are trying to get out ahead of that. Displacement is certainly a, a major part of this sub area plan uh, in the. Uh, uh, scope of work that we have out there for the consultants to look at. So we're, we're looking forward to some help in how to deal with that very challenging task uh, as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Leonard. Uh, Gretchen. Thank you. First of all, thank you for your presentations today. They were extremely informative. Um, and I was really thankful to hear one of you say that you're reevaluating empty um, developments for housing. I think that that's really important for our environment and for sustainability. Um, and I am really grateful for the way that you framed affordability as well. Affordability does, is not a negative term. Um, we have to really be creative in how we're attracting and retaining our residents, especially our next generations, um, which leads me to my question of are we considering smart homes for our next generation who is really going to continue to remote work? Um, multifamily solutions are amazing, but they usually lock people into leases. So are we considering smaller smart home opportunities for the next generation that is going to continue to remote work? Well, I, can, I can take a start at that. Uh, Rick and Mike can jump in. I, um, to, so smaller, yes, definitely. I think all three jurisdictions uh, have have um, increased our zoning to allow for uh, you know smaller units, duplex, triplex, fourplex kind of units. Uh, as and it, and we're also seeing in the multifamily uh, a trend towards smaller units, at least in Olympia. The majority of the multifamily units that have been constructed have been one or two bedroom units or studios. Um, and that might be helping with that downward or at least leveling off that Mark showed on the overall average um, rent of multifamily. Uh, I think that that's a pretty significant part of that is having a, a somewhat smaller units there. But to your question on smart um, homes, that's, you know, that's really a more of a market driven as developers come forward, you know, are they going to include that technology? Uh, my understanding is they are moving in that direction. We haven't you know, taken that on as a public uh, local government to to um, you know, have any requirements around that at this point. Um, but looking really to the developers who are trending in that direction already, uh, because that is, a, as you point out, a very strong trend. Um, Rick, Mike, anything to add to that? Yeah, the only the only thing to add to is was we see that shift of the multifamily and our from our single family market a lot of it has to do with uh, available land that can, can be developed as a single family uh, so we do have ordinances and we set the playing field to have ordinances in place that people want to build smaller units cottages those type of things we have other types of design for that infill parcel that's the two and three acre piece um, so we we can promote that but as just Leonard said it's market driven one other trend that we have seen in our multifamily design is we're having the same smaller unit studios, um, um, one bedrooms, but also we have two projects that are being built right now that are going to have live work units. Uh, and again, it's not uh, a home, but it's still a rental, but it is designed looking at this trend that we're seeing where we're going to see a lot more people working from home, if not full time, a uh, majority of the week. And I think that's also going to see some pressure on our market with the greater King County, because that creates more flexibility for additional people to commute and telecommute combined. Similar to Lacey and Olympia, we haven't really focused too much yet on the smart home aspect. I think it's a great point. We have though uh, increased where we allow cottage housing. And we've also, I don't think I mentioned this, but we've uh, reduced our, our fee amounts also for smaller single family housing. And I think that's key to about 1,400 square feet and below. So we have definitely focused on smaller single family housing as well, but not smart homes so much yet. 
Thank you. It looks like clerk has a question. Thank you, Hillary. Um, boy, I'm, I'm pretty inspired by getting to hear all in one place, the stories of the three cities. I'll be bringing ideas back to our land use committee. Um, I, one of the things I'm thinking about is in TRPC's initial look and study that sort of positioned us for creating these housing action plans, we talked about a tension about sprawl and trying to meet the sustainable thirst and goals of, of density and, and encouraging infill. I know we've, we've talked about several measures. Could you speak to the impact of um, annexations over the last couple of years and what might that do to this changing balance of single family, multifamily units? I guess I'll I'll, uh, I'll take that one on because we've done some recent annexations and um, there is always conversation about additional and the challenge um, with the annexations is when we look at our especially the eastern portion of our urban growth area which is a very large geographical area and well as, as a pretty fairly strong population most of that land is already either built or entitled and so again it's it's, it's building off of yesterday's plans and, and those visions from, from, from the previous years. So as we annex, we, there's gonna be, um, one is the cost of bringing that in and then how do you figure out what properties are available for that infill and what's, what's the, uh, the land use pattern and the um, appetite for the existing neighborhoods. Uh, but that is something that we're going back into joint planning this spring with the county to talk about that urban growth area, how we, uh, um, Get our plans consistent um, and uh, and current, and then uh, figure out what that looks like for the, over the next twenty years. Thank you, Mark. Can I insert a question really quickly, just to like consideration? Absolutely. So I I want to express appreciation as well. And one question I I had is is just. How is the thinking about who will be living in our community informing some of the planning? And so I appreciate all of the conversation about affordability. And one thing that came up for me is that we're talking about multifamily housing and then we're referring to studios. That's not really family housing, right? And so um, in terms of families that have children usually are not living in studios or that is not desirable housing. As a parent, I do not wanna live in a studio with my children. And so the, the question I have is, how are we looking at sort of average bedroom size in unit and trying to use that maybe as a tool to understand whether we're creating a really robust system of housing for lots of different families at different stages of their, their lives? I, I'll jump in. I, um, that was what was so helpful about the TRPC data portion of our regional housing action plans um, because we had a lot of good demographic data and, and I'd encourage all of you to, to take a look at that. It's, it's really robust. Um, it, it does identify from a lot of different perspectives what the, what the future looks like in terms of family size, household size, uh, makeup. Um, and, and a lot of other demographic data. Um, interestingly, actually, we are trending towards small, much smaller household sizes. Uh, and Olympia, I think more so than, than, Rick, than Rick and Mike's uh, plans need to, to um, look at. Uh, in Olympia, we are trending towards, and I may be slightly off on these numbers, but from my memory, it, uh, trending towards having as much as 70% of our households be uh, two persons or less. In the in the future, so uh, and we're already uh, you know a majority rental community. So um, we, in Olympia, we do see the trend toward multifamily and smaller units is actually matching the demographics and the growth that we're seeing. That doesn't mean obviously that uh, there aren't going to be families needing housing. Where overall growth in all areas is is increasing, so we do need to do that as well. Um, and um, actually. Some of you may have heard of a project the city has on city owned land on Boulevard Road, where we are um, looking and taking development proposals specifically for that purpose, trying to have a little more family housing there. So uh, that's one of the things we're doing to help address that. Yeah, and in our, in our um, again, going back to the data, I'm gonna just put a plug for this effort because in, in my uh, years of experience of working on plans, this is, this is very unique to have this much data that was able to work through our, our coordinated partnership 
to develop the that background because it is very rich, as, as Leonard said. And of course, we our debt household size um, have decreased a little bit, but still the, the 2.2, 2.4 range. And you know, I talked about that existing inventory and movement within. You, we always need to focus on also all new construction, but we got to also focus on the existing inventory and how do we get movement within it. And because um, that being stating it creates a challenge because people can't find entry level housing. People can't find that downsized place because, and so they're stuck, stuck in place. So one of the things that they'll want to try to keep out there and talk about housing types too is um, a lot of your older stock is, is individuals that are maybe empty nesters or maybe downsized can't find that place, but they don't necessarily want to go into a retirement community yet. So how do we help facilitate condo construction so they can have some equity buy a place and downsize and that opens up potentially that next starter house or second level house so those are the type of things we kind of also keep keep an eye on and that the condo is a, a challenging project in in the state of washington with the current um, laws at the state level for liability issues and so that's there's some legislative fixes that need to happen but also too in our urban growth there we do have a developer that specializes in condo construction doing a condo project um, that I don't have a lot of information about, but at least it's a sign of somebody taking that on in, in a current uh, development. Yeah, and Tom Water too, where we really focus on, you know, it's, it's a market driven deal. So we really focus on having a regulatory process and regime that allows a whole mix of housing types, everything from the studios to, to larger, more expensive houses. And we try to remind ourselves that if I'm a pretty wealthy person and I want a house that's say eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollars, just say hypothetically, uh, if I can't find that, it's really easy for me to buy down and buy a five hundred, five hundred or six hundred thousand dollar house. But that shoves everything down, of course. And you get down to the lower levels of the housing market, and then people are just left out. And so we try to remember to have, just have a wide variety of housing coming out on the market as much as we can help assist with that. Great. Mark, did you want to share? And yeah, then I just want to we'll close questions and go to a quick break. I just wanted to mention and 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 make a plea. We started here with the the three cities because we had supported work um, with Lacey, Olympia, and Tumwater. But um, folks might remember that some of our fastest growing areas in our county are Yelm, Rainier, Tenino. Um, and so I would love if there's staff capacity, I'd love to, to reach out to our South County jurisdictions and Bucota um, to, to see if we can pull together some similar information. Um, I know Yelm is, it just got its water right. So there's gonna be a lot of development going on there soon. So I'd, lo I'd love to bring back at a future council meeting some of this uh, same snapshot for South County if there's um, staff capacity to, to do so. So sure. I'll reach out to, to members about that. Thank you. That sounds amazing. Um, thank you so much. Um, thanks for uh, all of the great information. Thanks to those of you down the agenda who are being flexible. Um, I really believe strongly in bio breaks and stretch breaks. So we're going to shorten it and make it three minutes. Let's come back at 1015 and we'll start the call for projects update with Vina, Karen, and Paul. Thanks all. Thanks for having us.
All right, are we ready? Everybody back? Great. We are gonna move on to the call for projects update from Vina, uh, Karen, and Paul. Thank you. So we've been talking to you about the call for projects update um, over the last few months. And again, I'm Vina Tabbitt from TRPC, the deputy director here. And Karen Parker is Direct Planning and Program Manager Director, and Paul Brewster, a senior planner here, are also here to answer your questions. And with that, I'm going to jump into um, the last piece of our regional priorities criteria, the equity criteria. Last month, we reviewed the other three pieces of the regional priorities criteria. So just as a reminder for those of you that may not have been here last month, um, why are we updating our process? We are trying to tie our process more directly to performance goals and targets and um, have a competitive process that's very clear and transparent, very clear and transparent evaluation criteria. So our partners who submit projects will know how their projects rank, what projects will be the most um, eligible. And then we also are trying to position our region to meet our targets and el be eligible for additional funding. So we talked last month about our project priorities. So we're maintaining some very strong project priorities that we've had for many, many years. Um, they may be labeled a little bit differently, but they're still the types of projects we have funded in the past. And last month, we talked about three of the regional priorities, efficient use of federal funding, our urban corridors and centers, and um, reaching our climate plan goals. And now we're going to talk about equity, our last one. And then we'll be coming back to you to talk about set aside and funding caps at a future date. So when we're looking at equity, um, how we approach this, because it, it's a real, it's been a consideration across the country for the last few years. Um, we did a lot of background research. We um, also drafted an equity goal. We brought that to you last year. And then we put that on our transportation priority surveys to do a community check-in. And Katrina talked a little bit about that last month with you. And I think she'll be bringing more information on that again. We did some thinking about the types of equity. Um, we also did, an, we um, asked our, the community, what types of projects do you feel um, that you prioritize, what would you prioritize? And then we analyze those by the demographics of folks who answered. And I'll talk a lot more about that um, in uh, future slides. And then um, we also thought about how the pro an individual project might have benefits and burdens on um, different types of folks, different demographics. So some of the background research, um, we were lucky there was a couple, a research projects that had just finished up by the when we were looking and um, one recent study looked posed the exact question we were asking how can you integrate equity into prioritizing project selection for metropolitan planning organizations or organizations like us the exact question that we're trying to go and their conclusions um were kind of vague because things are all over the place um it Basically, it varies very differently between the organizations. Some larger organizations do complete set-asides, like this pot of funding is just for equity projects. Others are more like us, um, what we're going to propose. Um, some are much less formal. And they concluded that it's really about the local context and the unique planning environment. But the uh, public involvement is imperative. It's really, really important to get community input and buy-in. And then um, another study emphasized it's really important to have a clear understanding of what is meant by transportation equity, which is one of the reasons we did the check-in with our community on the transportation goal. So some of the types of equity uh, that we we're talking about, there's a procedural equity, and that's defined as looking at the degree of involvement of adverse public stakeholders um, in the process where decision-making is made. Now here, your, our council, you all are decision makers and you are selected by representing your organizations. So we as an MPO don't have an ability to influence that selection. That is up to you all as members. There is a little bit more um, on the transportation, uh, an opening on the transportation policy board because we have community representatives and business representatives. But um, we also looked at getting folks a really broad range of input from people right at the beginning with our community survey. There's also geographic equity, and that's focused on making, focusing the distribution of impacts 
and benefits across geographic space, geography and space. And we're taking that to mean that we um, should make sure that not one jurisdiction sweeps the pot when we have a funding call for projects, that we're able to fund a variety of projects in different parts of the county. And then there's social equity. And that is generally what a lot of people think of as equity, where it's focused on the distribution for different population groups that can differ, that can be equal or differ by income, social class, mobility, mobility ability, um, and things, different demographic characteristics. So for procedural equity, I've mentioned this before, and we've talked to you about our survey. It, the survey was designed specific, this was our primary goal of the survey. So we asked people who participate in the survey, please mark how important the following types of um, studies, projects, and programs are to you. And we just simplified the types of projects that we fund generally in those categories that I talked about before. So these were the right, these were the choices folks had. And then, um, so then we said, okay, so for all respondents, what were the top five that they chose? And these were the ones they did, planning studies, um, intersection safer, making crossing streets safer, increase road maintenance, and adding sidewalks and safe street crossings. Then we said, okay, will that differ by different demographic groups? Um, so we looked at what did respondents of color say? What did um, folks with a household income of less than 35,000 pick as their top five, five priorities? How about folks who have um, transportation barriers? We had asked on the question, do you have barriers to jobs or to other um, um, act services to meet your daily needs on the survey? How about, oh, job barriers. Um, the other one might've been, oh, and then a disability. So do you have a disability that affects mobility? So looking at those five different groups, we then said, okay, so of those five groups, which of these different types of projects and uh, programs were in the top five of three of the five different groups? So the first one was um, conduct planning studies and uh, sounded that folks wanted us to be really thoughtful about the type of investments were made and do some planning up front. Safety came up very strongly as well. All three of the safety types of projects, making intersections safer, that could range from um, um, putting potentially a roundabout in versus a signal to slow down traffic and that sort of thing. Um, making cross, crossing the street safer, so lots of um, options in there, and making bus stops more convenient and safe for bike, uh, bus riders. We all know that bus riders also have to cross the street because the bus will drop you off on one side of the street and pick you up on the other. And then under active transportation, a little bit of overlap, but also add sidewalks and make safe street crossings, um, adds crossings to existing streets. So safety and active transportation came up very strongly. And then um, road maintenance also came up. So those were the projects that came up um, as strong priorities for three of our five underserved groups. They were also strong for all respondees. So there really wasn't a huge difference there, but it was really great to take a deeper look into um, analyzing it. I will say that there wasn't a huge spread between, um, you know, the top five and the others. Uh, there was a strong um, agreement that all the projects we fund are really important to our community so that there was nothing that came out as no one wants to do this. Okay. Um, we talked about geographic equity, and um, rather than address that in the equity criteria, we will be talking about how to distribute um, projects across space using funding caps. And then social equity, looking at project-specific benefits and burden, and those could be either by project design or location. Um, oops, I'm going to go back one. So for instance, um, we may have a sidewalk project that's proposed, or two sidewalk projects that that are proposed. So they're both um, um, came up on that top five list, but one might be in a school district that um, serves mainly um, folks who, a high proportion of folks who are on free and reduced lunch, so economic burdened households. And another might not be in that. So what we're suggesting is that we'd evaluate each type of project and look specifically if there's um, a particular benefit to an underserved population. And so how we're suggesting the criteria would be is a project type. If it's one of those project types, those five that I mentioned, they get one point for being on the top five list. 
An additional project point if the project has a um, benefit to an underserved population, like I just mentioned. Um, and then a minus one point if it's got a burden on an underserved population. For example, if a project's designed where it precludes active transportation, if it creates a barrier to people crossing the street, then that would be a negative one. Or if, say, there was a new road connection through a low-income neighborhood where other alignments were feasible, that would be a negative one. We don't anticipate projects like this coming forward because we anticipate our jurisdictions are doing this up front and they wouldn't propose them. But we want to acknowledge that if those do come up, we have a mechanism for um, taking a point away. So any questions on our, well, actually, I'll just finish up and then we can take questions. So. Our next steps are to look at funding set-asides, then go out for a public comment on the entire process, and then do a call for projects next fall. So I'm gonna stop sharing and see if you have any questions. Thank you, that was great. And we have Karen and Paul here as well, right? We do. Okay, are there any questions from members? I'm looking for hands. Any questions about the presentation or the equity criteria? We have no action on this today, correct? You Just don't. Information. Yeah, we'll package everything up and you'll take action on it later this spring, early summer. Okay. Great, I see Steve. Oh, Steve Bukota, we missed you in introductions. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, I'm here from uh, five feet west of the bright shining center of the known universe. That is beautiful downtown Bucota. Uh, on the equity uh, side, and this may not be the, the proper form to ask, but uh, a couple of weeks ago, yeah, about two weeks ago, it was uh, really brought forward how little access Bucota has when our train, our uh, railroad crossing is closed. That is our primary way in and out. Uh, when it's closed, yeah, you can go up uh, Tono Road and uh, add about another 20 miles, uh, 20 to 30 minutes on your trip just to get across to the other side of the railroad tracks. Uh, and Burlington Northern asked me why we don't have an access road about to uh, 183rd to, to the north. I said, well, that was a project that has been considered for as long as I've been in Bucota, but, uh, and sometime before my time, probably even on this planet, uh, there was a road. Is, is this the type of project we're looking for? Or do, I, uh, do I need to go talk to somebody else about that? We're getting an access road from Bucota to 183rd. So if we, God forbid, have another train wreck, or something happens out here where we cannot get across the railroad tracks to access 507. Uh, we have the other, uh, uh, you know, secondary uh, access to 183rd. Um, so Paul is actually much more familiar with the planning around that type of project. He um, they looked at that when they did a trail feasibility study in that area, but just in general, um, that type of project is the type that could be funded um, through here if it was had been planned and then you had a cost estimate and that sort of thing. So I'll let Paul perhaps talk about the particular project, unless the chair wants us to take this offline and have a deeper discussion with you about that project. Let's see if there's any other questions about the equity considerations first. Um, does that work for you, Steve? Cool, okay, thanks. Any other questions about the, the equity considerations or the presentation? Okay, great. Thank you so much, you guys. That is, was a really great presentation and I'm super excited about how um, detailed it was, and I appreciate all the hard work that went into it. Thank you. We are going to transition now to our next agenda item, which is the legislative update. Don't go anywhere, Karen Parker. Steer up. All right. Thank you very much. I'm going to be very quick. Um, just to remind you that uh, today is the last day for uh, the 
uh, legislator to pass bills from the opposite house. So the house is busy looking at Senate bills. The Senate is busy looking at house bills. Um, I know that the Senate had adjourned by midnight last night. The house was still rolling. So they all came back in uh, at 10 o'clock this morning. And um, so, and then they move into those initiatives and budgets, uh, all of the budgets, pretty much are in conference committees. And so they're working on that. So I'm gonna limit my update today to uh, part of our legislative priorities list. So we had two legislative priorities uh, this year. One was our I-5 work and looking at continued funding for that effort. And um, that is in the Senate additive transportation budget as well as funding that was already provided in the supplemental budget. So the last time I saw copies of the budget, there had been no reductions in what was um, funded for I-5. Um, the other issue, and then of course, we're also talking about transit, we're talking about multimodal. So as we look at transportation, yeah, we're really focused on I-5 and we want the rest of the system, system to work well as, uh, as well. And so there are uh, still some funding available for transit in all of the budgets. There's a real emphasis on that. Um, and uh, multimodal kinds of things. There are additions to safe routes to school funding in the budgets. There are additions to bike and pedestrian. So there are lots of those kinds of things. So that's kind of what's happening in transportation. Let me just go and see if I see anything else that is really interesting. Um, I was going to mention that we had um, the trucking industry come and talk to us not too long ago to the council, I think it was last year, um, but there were a number of bills that were about how do truckers be able to take their breaks and use restrooms and what happens when the um, um, availability of um, uh, you know, rest areas that are off the highway are closed for a variety of reasons. So there really has been an effort to try and solve that. There have been a number of bills that have passed about that. And so I think that is uh, fascinating. We also uh, had some bills around energy and electricity um, about, you know, homeowners associations not being able to uh, disallow uh, charging stations in those areas. So lots of working around the edges of that. The other piece that I would mention is broadband was another of our priorities. And I have been really interested. I'm just going to take a minute to say um, during the pandemic, it was all about, are we connected? Now that we're starting to sort of ease back into some normalcy, the conversations have become deeper. It isn't just, do you have it? It is, can you afford it? What's the speed? Do you have access to the devices that you need to actually interact? And then do you have the skills to use it? So it's been really interesting to see us move from just this emergency um, to a deeper dive. So there are several bills that are there. I think probably one of the most important ones um, really is to look at the definition of broadband and to recognize that having broadband but having it too slow to actually support the work that you need to do is the same as not having broadband. So as they're looking at drawing these maps, that was a really important distinction. Um, and then there's funding in um, all versions of the budget. We are looking at some funding from um, the federal government as well. So broadband is still alive and well, and several of the bills that deal with broadband are in on the House floor and the Senate floor today um, for working on things. Just a couple other minor things, uh, not minor. Um, there's funding for school seismic grants, which is a pretty new thing. So they were looking at some emergency funding. Um, there's some traffic safety work that allows jurisdictions to lower speed limits to improve safety. Uh, what else did I pull out? Um, 
inner branch advisory committee, which basically says they don't think that the House, uh, that the legislature and the judiciary and the governor's office are working well enough together. And so um, they've passed the creation of an inner branch advisory committee. Um, we're looking at greenhouse gas emissions in um, um, buildings, and we're looking at appliance uh, efficiency standards. I'm moving. Um, a real interest in how tribes work with government entities. So including tribes around looking at the Growth Management Act and also with schools. So really creating a stronger government to government relationship. And uh, let's see, I guess the last one I will mention because the sun is out is they uh, passed legislation to say, 12 days a year you can use um, not only our state parks free, but all the lands that DF, uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife and DNR have as wilderness kinds of areas, you can use theirs free. So that was my little piece of what I care about today. Um, questions about our legislative package, we're doing very well. We also have a new thing that um, I have no idea if it will move forward, but um, the Senate transportation chair came to us and said, we want you to be looking at high capacity transportation. So there is a budget item in the uh, transportation supplemental budget that would uh, build off of the work we're already doing in looking at high capacity transportation. And let's remember that that includes HOV lanes that support transit, it could include rail, bus rapid transit, which inner city transit is always mo also moving forward on. So again, uh, it also includes continuing to look at the ferries based on the study that was done a few years ago. So it was really broad, broadly saying, wait a minute, it's not just about um, cars and I-5. There are some other issues we need to look at. So we're still on that. That's all I have. If there are questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Karen. Are there any questions from council members? Yep. Okay. Can uh, I? Yep. Sorry, Robin. I was just waiting to see if anyone who hadn't spoken was interested, and it doesn't look like anyone is, so go ahead. Just real quick, Karen, what's the bill number on that high capacity uh, bill? It is the uh, transportation budget. Let me just pull it out. Oh, a second. It's yeah, it's the the supplemental. Yeah, it's the supplemental transportation budget. Um, All right. And I I'll just, just, yeah, I'll search high capacity. You. Okay. Yeah. I have Thanks. it. I'm just looking. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, great. So, Karen, you're looking for it. So, you'll let us know if you find it. I will. And uh, it looks like any other questions besides John? And if not, John, you can go ahead and take a swing. Okay, hey, go ahead, John. Oh, you're muted, John. Yeah, I see that. As far as broadband, uh, when they gave a presentation last year, I started bringing up Ucoda and they shut up. What are they what are they actually looking at as far as broadband and availability and bringing it to places like Bucota that actually need it? Um, well, I think that's the the more subtle conversation that I said has started to happen. Will it happen? What's important is what if you want federal money or state money, you need to have done some mapping activities to show not only where you have broadband and where you don't, but what speed might be available. And as I mentioned, we're starting to look at, can you afford to use it? Can you, do you have the skills to use it? So when we're, I'm not saying that uh, Bucota is unskilled in this. I'm just saying they're trying to get the whole package going. So I believe the bill that changes the definition of who has broadband and who doesn't should put Bucota on the map. Yes. And that's the first step. I mean, I mean, interesting, not industry transit, but uh, Comcast actually knows a lot of that information. That's why they're not out there is because it's not affordable for them. They can't make it affordable for the people out there and they can't afford to run the lines out there. Mm -hmm. uh, so all they have is as far as outside communications would be uh, so like Comcast, not Comcast, but uh, Direct TV or Dish Network and using mm -hmm. their, their direct satellite links. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and not affordable, not affordable. Yeah, so I don't have a definitive answer for Bucota other than, as I said, I was pleased that the definition starts to really look at, wait a minute, what, what does haves and have nots mean? Okay. My last two cents on that, then I'll shut up, is that uh, if the state's going to be doing stuff like this, uh, we should be looking at those type of jurisdictions first and foremost, and then expand out from there. And that's my two cents, and I'll shut up now. Okay, well, I'll, I'm going to make one comment on that, and um, that is the uh, availability in rural communities has been a focus on both sides of the aisle in both houses, both chambers. And so looking at those broad swaths of Eastern Washington as well as Central Washington, that huge amounts of people don't have it, but also looking at these pockets where we have rural areas within more urban counties that don't have it. So our representatives have been mentioning, I don't know if it's Dakota by name, but of mentioning, wait a minute, it's not just Eastern Washington who has rural uh, areas that we need to consider. So the discussion has been good. Just quickly to piggyback on that, the broadband action team um, we've heard about, and this maybe is what Council Member Purcell is about to talk about, um, uh, uh, the county and Nisqually Indian tribe are working on a, a, an agreement and part of what they would be doing is looking at broadband availability throughout the county um, so that then we can work on uh, plans to get broadband throughout the county uh, and Dakota has come up as one of those areas that that um, we we know uh, needs a higher speed service. Thanks, Mark. Um, Steve, did you have something you wanted to say about this or? Uh, yeah, we Dakota does have fiber already, and it is available. Nobody's. Uh, decided to put the money out for it yet but it is available to a large number if not the majority of people here in town i don't have it on my uh down at my house because i live on the other side of the river as we like to say we, you've got the good side of the river and then you've got everybody else i <laughs> guess I, yeah anyway uh but yeah we do have uh, fiber out here in town from uh, uh tonino telephone and uh, I know the uh, the town buildings have it, uh, and like I said, it's uh, it's available out here in just about the entire uh, west side of the river uh, uh, town. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, Helen, did you have a comment or question about the legislative yeah. update? Uh, well, about the wireless, I just wanted to remind folks that the county is also right now working on revising its wireless code. Um, so that's something to be aware of. Uh, and in looking at that, you know, Pierce County is kind of making a priority of providing rural broadband. So it might be worth paying attention to what they're doing as well. Thanks, Helen. Uh, Karen, did you want to wrap us up or does anybody else have questions for Karen before that? Okay, go ahead, Karen. Senate Bill 5689 is, oh, the, is the transportation supplemental budget. I just had it listed as transportation budget on everything. So um, that is in conference. Great. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions on the legislative update? Great work, team. <laughs> Lots of good momentum, congratulations. Okay, we are gonna to move to the next item, which is our report from outside committee assignments. And I think we have Helen here for the Puget Sound Regional Council Growth Management Board. Helen, do you have anything to share? Well, I either have a ton to share or just a really brief um, because uh, their main topic was the same as uh, one of our main topics today, which is housing. Um, and implementation of, of their plan. Um, and they it was a really interesting discussion, um, but the, uh, the focus was, was on um, 
really refining a lot of the themes that we touched on today as well, especially information, data gathering, and, and the importance of really um, getting fine-tuned with your housing typologies and applying data to that. You know, they're, they're working very hard on that. Um, I really uh, suggest to everybody who has any interest in housing policy that you poke around the PSRC housing website. Um, they're really working on developing just tons of tools. Uh, they're focusing a lot right now on helping to roll out the information to, um, you know, they have 86 jurisdictions they deal with and helping to roll out useful information, especially for those uh, that don't have robust planning departments and that are starting to work on their growth management plan updates. They're going to be doing a lot of workshops and other kinds of outreach, um, which might be worth paying attention to. Uh, they're, they're trying to set up a way of um, robustly monitoring the impacts of policy. That's a big focus for the PSRC right now is you know, now that they're implementing plans to increase affordable housing, what's actually working and what isn't, they really want to be able to, to track that. And so they're working on tools to do that. It was interesting to hear, uh, apparently they're doing a thing with um, data dashboards so that cities can sort of track what other cities are doing um, regarding housing policy which I thought was a really interesting idea. Um, let's see, what else uh, can I say very quickly because there was so much that was talked about. Um, oh, well, you might want to know that there was discussion about um, future legislation. And again, we, ta we tapped on that a little bit here today. Uh, it looks like there's gonna be um, going forward uh, real push on the condo issue at the state level. Um, so making it easier to build condos, recognizing that that's, that's a real gap. Um, and also looking at other uh, obstacles to middle density housing. So they were talking about, especially their sort of barriers with um, utilities, getting utilities in. And I think we touched on that a little bit today too. Um, yeah, so I'll just stop there because there's so much to talk about, but um, not enough time. So <laughs> that's it. Well, maybe we can make sure to, that we get out the link to the website that you were referencing, just reminding um, council members that they can check out some of the stuff that you're talking about. Because yeah, it sounds like there's lots of good connection there. Thank you, Helen. Yep. Um, that brings us to the executive director's report, Mark. Yeah, I'll be very brief. Um, really one item, and, and I've had some uh, council members and policy board members ask about when, when uh, we might be hosting hybrid meetings here in our new office. And I'm, I'm asking um, the officers of council and TPB um, to consider May um, for that. We still need to work out our, our conference room and make sure we have an excellent uh, hybrid experience for, for folks and also um, most of you have not seen our new space. And so this, these first meetings will essentially be our, our housewarming. So we want to also have some time to, to get ready for that. So uh, hopefully that, that works for folks to consider May as that, that first opportunity for a hybrid meeting. So what, one more uh, fully remote, if, if that is okay. Thank you. I'm excited. Um, yeah, it'll be great to see people in person. Um, so thank you, Mark. Um, and you guys, if you haven't been to the new space, you're gonna love it, it's great. Um, okay, so that brings us to member check-in and I think we'll have a queue and I wanna just in, make an additional invitation for member check-in. Um, if there's something you'd like to share out for the members to know from your jurisdiction, that's great, but maybe you'd like to share if there's one takeaway you plan to take back to your jurisdiction from the many, um, presentations that we have received. Um, so 
I will start that tradition by just saying one of the things I'm excited to take back to my jurisdiction is an invitation to watch the excellent housing presentation and also that I'm going to connect with our transportation staff about the smart corridors um, presentation and just have some some conversation about that. So I'm looking for the queue to see if there's anyone who wants to. I see John's in the queue and anyone just want to kind of see who's who's in the queue. It looks like John and Clark. Okay, John, go ahead. Okay, just a little brag. I don't know if uh, I'm, I'm uh, also a fire commissioner over here in Tonino. Uh, we just got uh, the fire department just got our uh, assessment as to how we can evaluate things. We got a double A assessment. So that's good. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to bring up real quick is maybe at some point we'd have EDC come down and give us an overview of what kind of businesses are actually starting to move in here. We've got a lot of people that are moving in here. And if uh, the numbers are correct, and we're looking at about $1,200 uh, minimum rent, uh, we need uh, more than just uh, service industry to have enough money for people to afford these kind of places. And I'm not sure I've heard of anything moving in besides service industry type places. Uh, so that might be something worth a, a minute for us to look at. If you can do something along those lines, Mark, that'd be great. Thank you. Thanks, John. Clark, go ahead. Great. I, I just, I really wanted to appreciate Karen's work. Um, I got to sit as part of the legislative um, committee and um, I appreciated the, the conversation this afternoon or this morning. Um, and and I, I wanted to just to mention with, to John's question about Bucoda and how do we serve it? I think that TRPC better understands how we might serve everybody equitably in our county than, than the state organization or a federal organization. And for that reason, our specific ask when we met with legislators was that they consider using regional planning authorities to coordinate these broadband efforts. And I, so I just wanna say that's what we were asking for because I, I think that this group sitting around this table knows Bucota better than any legislative group. So. Thank you. Here, here on the snaps for Karen. Okay, um, Helen, you're next. Yeah, I just have a little self-serving re reminder on the part of the conservation district that our uh, native plant days event is tomorrow, 10 to three, please go. It's not just the, the plant sale, but there are going to be information tables and music and good stuff like that. So please go to the fairgrounds tomorrow. I will thank you personally for that reminder, Helen. Are there any other member sharings or appreciations or things you would like to bring out to your jurisdictions from um, what you heard today? Anyone, anyone? Well, oh wait, Robin, go ahead. Just real briefly, I, I really appreciated the presentation from the three cities on what they're doing to address the housing affordability issues that we're facing. And I wanna bring back to my council that although Lacey doesn't have as many affordable units in the pipeline right now as the other jurisdictions, we're, do, we're implementing a lot of the same policies. And so I think we need to stay the course or even kind of lean in a little bit more to ensure that we start seeing some affordable units developed in Lacey to meet the need. So thank you everybody for those presentations. Cool, thank you, Robin, for sharing. Eileen. I would like to echo that as well. Um, since we don't have an opportunity, this is like the closest we have as far as the jurisdictions to be able to share information like this. And so I really, really appreciated um, the housing update and also the information um, from the survey that uh, was held for the um, uh, equity survey. Because I'm curious um, how you accomplished that because um, Tom Warner's in the process of doing a community survey too. And how do you reach everyone, that broad audience? So, um, so I was pleased to see those results as well. Thank you, Eileen. Um, I will echo, echo your cheers and snaps for that one too. Are there any other comments, um, appreciations, or things you wanna bring back to your jurisdiction? 
Okay. Well then against all odds, we are actually early. Can we leave early, Mark, or we yes, can? Yes, you, you can adjourn, yes. Okay, now well, thank you. Motion. Yeah, thank you everyone. Oh wait, nope, Steve has his hand up. Hang on. Yeah, uh, ju just wanted to, by, by a quick show of hands, how many have been to Bucota lately? I haven't. What is the matter with you people? <laughs> I drove through, Steve. That, that's not good enough. You come out. You you come out. Let me know you're coming. I'll dust off Hersula. Give you the fifty cent tour of the of the town and introduce you to some of our resident ghosts here. And uh, probably bore you to death talking about the spooktacular. So come see Bucota. We're here. See right here, right five feet west of the bright shining center of the known universe. I love that idea. Maybe we can have like a, a, a mobile meeting once in a while. That would be awesome. And, 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 and we have done that in the past. So hopefully yeah. we can get back yeah. to that. Bring, we, we, we've been to City Hall at Yakota and it was for a retreat. It was awesome. Yeah, I've got a great big room right upstairs and I've got Good Joe's college. place right across the street. Well, the, world, the world renowned Joe's place. Be careful what you wish for, Steve. You're going to get us all now. <laughs> oh, I was in the army for 20 years. You know, I can I can pretty much deal with anything. Nice. All right. Well, I'll make a note of it. Let's yeah, chat more. I was there, got stuck behind, stuck by the train. Well, maybe we can try and time that a little better. Are there any other comments from members? All right. Well, then, do we need to move to adjourn? No, no, you are no. you are able to just, adjourn. Yep. I don't have a gavel, but I have a pen. And so I'm going to say, if there are no other comments, <laughs> then we are adjourned. No, I'm Pick your pen. Function. All, all right. have a great Thanks day. Thanks all. Have a great weekend. Thank you.